What we're going to do tonight is to begin a new class. We haven't started a new class in years around here. And it's going to be on New Testament introduction. <laughs> so I have, yeah, we have a lot of outlines to pass out. So I have a lot I want to say about that before I pass those out or before we get into that. I realize that this will make us face four different series or classes per week all at the same time without our general type studies that we can do on Wednesday night. I think it's always a danger that you can be overloaded in, in an area of just looking at facts and materials and things like that and not have that personableness or that personal side to things. So there are several suggestions for remedies. Uh, number one, you have many, many, many other tapes that you can select during the week to listen to on a lot of personal areas. Even in some series like Ethics, you could find all types of things to listen to in that. Number two, as we've just seen tonight in our worship and testimony time, there's a whole lot of ministry, and it rightfully so, that should and does take place almost all the time right there where God can speak to your heart about different things through songs that are sung, through testimonies, through gifts, and so forth. Number three, in ethics, we're, I, I notice that we're just combining the beginning of, of New Testament with the end of looking for several weeks now at some technical matters with Bonhoeffer. We're through with that. We'll be into some uh, easier material in ethics, concluding secularism. We'll get into some new and different and additional uh, American worldviews, but because secularism, as you'll remember back from the very beginning, is the umbrella of all uh, Wilton Chongs in America, worldviews in America, then what we said about it is going to apply to a lot of other areas, so we're not going to duplicate that material. In other words, I don't think we'll spend nearly as much time on other worldviews in American uh, society today as we've spent on secularism. And I think the others won't be as technical. Uh, some of them will have a, a message or two that may be a little technical, but most of them I don't think will be that way. And then we're going to be into some very practical areas concerning the mental side and the subject of worldliness. Then in the fourth place, this New Testament intro class, what we're going to do is try to stay by the notes that I did a number of years ago that I worked up. Occasionally, they'll be a little technical. <laughs> don't laugh whenever I say that. <laughs> I'm trying to keep a straight face while I say it. <laughs> Praise God, somebody in the church thinks I have some tact. I know a lot of people that don't think I have any tact <laughs> when it comes to witnessing or preaching. So praise God, somebody has their head on right. <laughs> I don't know what that says about the rest of you folk. No one else gave a testimony. Well, I know what it says about a lot of people outside this church. We think we're right. We know we're right because God Amen. says that we can know that we're right Amen. when we know things. But in this New Testament intro class, in the first place, I know we've got, a, we've got several new people here, new Christians that we've come into contact with that I think it'd be a real blessing for them to kind of start off in the early phases of their Christian charismatic walk with some understanding of the New Testament. And just because the rest of you have been here seven years doesn't mean you know everything you need to know about the New Testament. So it's going to be a rather a simplified class because, see, here's what we're going to do. It's going to be similar to Old Testament, but not as extensive as Old Testament intro. Because just think what could be said about each of the books of the New Testament. We all know them much better than we know the Old Testament books. You could get into them and do all types of introductory studies in you know each of the four gospels before even really studying them so we may have one message you know per book which is really what we would call an overview basically nothing but an introduction to that book and i'm going to go by a, a lot of information that i've researched in the past but whenever we really get into and i just i haven't been born or saved long enough i hadn't even born long enough to do the exhaustive studies in new testament books to make certain that all of these you know so-called facts are right if we have to revise something then we'll revise it later as far as those complicated things that are not very important anyway such as the dates of the composition of the new testament books other things are obvious. The content is obvious. When the books were written, uh, to whom they were written, 
where was the author when it was being written. Sometimes that can be a little fuzzy and a little sketchy. So I just will apologize in advance if we have to make some minor revisions on all of that in the future. Uh, so on these Wednesday nights, while we're going to be looking at New Testament intro, we're going to leave room open on Wednesday nights to do something else besides that. We may go four weeks and then take two weeks off and then go at it again because this is our night that we're supposed to have off. So remember, we're going we're gonna to keep it that way if we feel led to ha have some other type of service or message or something else to say on a Wednesday night. We're not going to feel bound to having four classes for technical classes, you know, four times a week and no opportunity for the Lord to say anything else to us. Another reason I feel that we need to get into this is the fact that I did these notes during the months of December and January of 1982 and 1983. That's over five years ago. So I'm just continuing to have a filling up of a backlog of things I've already worked on. I'm working on more now, and I've got some more thoughts in my mind mm -hmm. to work on some other things. None of us are getting any younger, except maybe the oldest ones in the church. They're <laughs> confessing youthfulness. The rest of us aren't getting any younger. So I, I keep thinking, you know, every year, well, is it time to start that? Well, we haven't finished everything else yet, and I keep waiting till we get finished, but... I'm just a little suspicious of the fact that we might ever get finished or not finished. <laughs> so it's just been sitting there for five years. The, the notes were typed up. I remember very specifically where I was and the whole atmosphere when these were done. They were done right at the conclusion to our uh, stay in the old building back in Waconia and whenever we moved out into meeting in the home, the church in the home. And Part of that was actually influenced our decision, let's say it this way, um, the timing of our decision to move. That was inevitable with the message that we preached that we were going to be out of that place sooner or later. Mm -hmm. The timing of it was directly influenced, I don't know if I've ever told you this, by my studies in New Testament introduction, especially on the book of Philemon, mm -hmm. because there is a mention of a church in the home in Philemon, and I remember exactly what I was reading. I was reading a Bible dictionary. I know which one it was. A right-hand page, left-hand column, top of the page. And it made a reference there to the fact that in the first three centuries, the churches met nowhere but in homes and similar situations. The church buildings aren't seen until third, fourth, fifth century. And they're on the rise after that. Well, what the Lord did, I remember sitting in my study in our Lake Street home in Waconia whenever I was doing that message. In this message I have here tonight on Philemon, uh, the Lord just impressed on me, well, why don't you do something about it then? I mean, we knew that. We were even teaching things like that. We had said that in so many words before, and the Lord just impressed on my heart, well, why don't you do something about it? So our move that you were, well remember, most of you anyway, that were here back then, will remember that move was influenced by the Philemon study here in New Testament introduction. So maybe some of those, all of those, are some kind of broad introductory thoughts to our study in New Testament introduction. It's not going to be a survey. It's going to be a little more than that. But it's not going to be as full scale as it could be, as I could easily make it. I just don't think that we're going to take the opportunity or take the time to do that. Now, what I have numbered before me here are 40 messages. If we do one, skip one, do four, skip one, then 40 could easily take over a year. That would take us into the summer of next year. I just don't know how it's all going to work out. I think that we've got about 30 messages left in ITP and about 25 in Biblical Lit. And uh, no guess how many left in Christian ethics. We're not even thinking of the end of that class. <laughs> but I know some other things that I think the Lord wants us to get into next year in 1989. So we need to get started on this. All right, let's send out some of these um, outlines. I don't know how many we're going to need here. I brought some that I have, but I have some more back in my study. On the order of Old Testament introduction. Introduction to the New Testament. Hallelujah. So some of you have been waiting for a number of years to get to this. You, We ended OT intro and you just thought we'd start New Testament right away. And 
then I laid on you ITP for about three years. <laughs> Which is really uh, properly done because something happened between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now I realize we're not through with ITP yet. You see, if I wanted to be real chronological and technical, then we have officially couldn't begin this until we finished ITP. But we're just going to go ahead and begin it anyway. The outline is not that long, not as long as some of the others, eight pages. Most of that's spent just with, you know, a listing of the different books and then date, purpose, characteristics, outline, date, purpose, characteristics, outline, you know, background, pretty much that information over and over. I can say this, there are a whole lot of things about the New Testament that you don't know. This has been um, made real to me in um, some of my talks with some of you. Nothing's, you know, seriously wrong. And in a, the test that we did last year at Lake George, <laughs> that there were some questions just about New Testament arrangement or who has this material versus who has that material. I mean, you know what the New Testament is saying. But uh, uh, take, for instance, the arguments about the letter of Ephesians. Is this really a letter to the Ephesians, or is it an encyclical? I think that's somewhere on the outline there. Well, see, I put all this together five years ago. Some of these things may have slipped out over the years. I know I said something about Ephesians being an encyclical letter just a few months ago. Um, but most of this I tried to keep to myself so I wouldn't spoil all of it whenever we get there. But the listing of the books, the dating of the books, authorship, purposes, and one of the things that you'll find to be most beneficial, I think, will be characteristics, characteristics of the books. You could probably guess some of the purposes yourself, but again, some of those may not be on the surface or so obvious either. Um, concerning the, so I actually have some left here then. All right. Concerning these so-called prison epistles, what did I call them here on the outline? Yeah, I think that's a better name, and I'll explain all that why, but uh, just one example, there are different theories. If you look under number, this is on page five, under letter A, introduction to captivity, number three, the place of Paul's imprisonment. There are different theories here that he was, that he wrote these when, um, he was in uh, Philippi in Macedonia, another one when he was in Caesarea, another when he was in uh, Ephesus, another which has been the traditional view uh, that he was in Rome. And you see there are various arguments in favor and against and problems with one as well as with the other. So there are a lot of little small things like that that you may find interesting as we go along. We're going to try to follow the outline fairly faithfully. So what we're going to be looking at tonight, I would assume, would be the New Testament material, numbers 1 and 2. Numbers 1 and 2. So you're going to have a whole lot of things written down for you, things that you need to spell. As you see there, a lot of things are already uh, spelt for you. Well, I'm sure there are other things I could say to, to introduce this. I, I could guess I could say this before I actually get into my notes and the message tonight, that it was about 11 years ago that uh, I began doing some study for New Testament introduction, began taking some notes for it then, and um, used that put that together with some other material once we move from Mississippi to Minnesota, which is really what has produced what we have for us tonight. I have not gone back, as far as I remember, I have not gone back in the last five years since I finished this material and uh, touched or updated anything here. Now, I may update some things or touch up some things as I go along, but in the last five years, this has been filed away in my files and I haven't even touched it. It's just stayed there for the last five years. So I just think that those things are, I know if I were you, I'd want to know whatever background I could know as to when it was done, under what conditions, because under what conditions and when can dictate some results. This is done five years ago, done as we were moving, right in the midst of our moving from the old building to the new building and so forth. 
So I think those are some important things to know. Okay, New Testament material. Number one on the outline, academic, the academic divisions of New Testament study. What we have there is what I'm going to begin with, the fact that there are four fields of concentration under New Testament studies, and the same is true with Old Testament. I have a purpose for going into all of this. You'll see here in a moment. That's kind of a history of our being together. And I guess when you get to the month of June, that's the month we started these studies seven years ago, then it brings back memories. Maybe that's another reason subconsciously we're getting into it, although the weather wouldn't remind you of anything like that out there today, or at least this evening. There are four fields of concentration. Uh, the first is called uh, the critical field, and I'm going to come back and say more about that in a moment, so we're going to skip over that for right now. Secondly, this is just to, to um, get you oriented to New Testament studies, or if you weren't here, for Old Testament studies. Secondly, historical. Now, this is where you would or could discuss things such as the life of Christ. A lot of schools or Bible institutes, colleges, seminaries, evangelical institutions will have courses entitled A Life of Christ, which is a very worthwhile study. Uh, you, you find it to be very difficult to separate that from a, an actual study of the gospel since your whole uh, source material for the life of Christ would be the four gospels and almost to study one is to study another and it becomes very difficult to know when to include what and when to leave out what. You could all also study here early church history. For instance, you could put the book of Acts here. You could uh, put the later Pauline epistles, so-called pastoral epistles, which is, again, not the best name, as we'll see for these things. I'm going to have a lot of things to share with you in this study. So you'll become very familiar with names and terminology, why some things are better than others. Pastoral epistles is not a good name, but that's a standard designation in English studies of those three books, 2 Timothys and Titus, generally in the order of 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy. You say, well, why, or maybe you're not saying, maybe, you're, maybe I'm too fast ahead of you tonight, why throw in pastoral epistles with Book of Acts for a study of early church history? Well, it's because a whole lot of the other epistles of Paul fit in the time period of Luke's writing the book of Acts. Amen. You can put Corinthians and a lot of those epistles right there somewhere in Thessalonians. You can be put between this verse and that verse, this chapter and that chapter and Acts. You can't do that to Timothy's and Titus. Those come later. So you've got other events which have taken place. The church has changed. Uh, various things such as uh, ministry offices have solidified. By the time we've gone from a very, very primitive state, and I don't mean primitive in, in some Darwinian sense, but a very primitive state of church, well, of church, of the nature and existence of the church itself, and especially church offices and ministries in the book of Acts, in the early chapters of Acts, uh, compare that with what you find over in the pastoral epistles, and you've seen uh, quite a change of events. And that one fault pattern that I've just given you right there serves as the basis for the modern day denominational argument that even though you can't find their denomination in the Bible, they still have reason for it because of the uh, fluidity that's seen in the New Testament as you go from the book of Acts over to the pastoral epistles. So once you know something about that, it helps you with that old dead denominational argument that I mean, whenever, this is what I tell a denominational person, show me your church in the Bible and I'll follow that pattern. Show me your church. Show me your denomination in there. Amen. Well, they'll tell you, well, it's not in there. Well, then the common man would think, well, if it's not in there, you don't have any justification for it then. But they have another argument. They say, but we see changes actually in the New Testament in the nature and organization and function and ministry offices and the structure of the church itself from the book of Acts to the pastorals, which then we could extrapolate to that from that period to our period and God would allow changes in the church today. But there are ways to get around that argument as we shall see some other place. Thirdly, the exegetical field. 
Everything, in other words, that we study in any formal sense in the New Testament, as well as the Old, the same four divisions hold for the Old, can fit, must fit, does fit in one of these four areas here. Everything that we study, everything that we say about the New Testament will fit in one of these four areas. Exegetical would be like book-by-book -book studies. especially if one is involving oneself in more than the various themes of chapters, which is called a thematic type study. There it's kind of more historical hyphen theological than really exegetical. Actually saying, asking ourselves first, what does the text say? For instance, our study years ago in the book of Acts was not exactly an exegetical study because we took large sections of Acts. That was the intention of that class. Large sections of it, studying it, not going verse by verse by verse, saying everything that could be said about the passage there. That wouldn't exactly fit in an exegetical area. The study in the Sermon on the Mount was more exegetical, done around the same period of time, because in the first place we had a smaller amount of material to deal with. And it becomes much easier to do an exegetical study whenever you're dealing with a smaller amount of material. You don't have to be dealing with uh, books. You can just look at specific, important, or problematic passages in the New Testament, uh, such as Paul's thorn in 2 Corinthians 12. And if you did a study of that, I mean really a study of that, that would fit under the exegetical field. And then fourthly, theological which sometimes is often called, uh, or also called, rather, New Testament theology. And this attempts to determine what the various theologies of the different authors of New Testament books were and what complete New Testament picture they present. In other words, what does James, the writer, have to say about the law? about faith, about human obedience, actions, and works. What does James have to say about that versus what the Apostle Paul has to say about that? So you've got the theology of James and the theology of Paul. Now, liberals have made a big to-do about that, thinking they can find different theologies, and of course by that they would mean contradictory, different theologies with different New Testament authors. So in New Testament theology, which has been a field almost dominated by liberals rather than conservatives, they've taken it to an extreme. A conservative would want to know what James would have to say, and he'd want to know what Paul would have to say, but a conservative has something else much more basic to his concern that lies behind it all, and that is the common authorship of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that gave the book of James and the epistles of Paul and the Holy Spirit's not going to contradict himself. He may, through James, choose to emphasize one particular thing and through Paul emphasize another. Of course, liberal scholars don't hold to the inspiration of Scripture as a conservative would. But conservatives have something much more basic that they are concerned about, and that is the common authorship of Scripture. It does no good. It's just an endeavor and foolishness to try to pit one New Testament author, book, or passage against another. We realize that God used men to write Scripture, but they were moved by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Now, let's come back to what I said would come back to the critical division of New Testament study. Our present study in New Testament introduction fits here. It fits here. There's nothing wrong with the idea or practice of biblical criticism as long as we don't adopt the underlying atheistic presuppositions of liberalism where they basically view the writings as merely human products. When one does that, then criticism becomes criticism as we often use the word in English today. Criticism simply means, you know, a diligent study of something in the way that we're using it. New Testament criticism. New Testament intro, I'm saying, fits here under Biblical New Testament criticism. And I'm saying that criticism is 
is a good idea. All that means is a diligent study of the New Testament. As long as we don't under, as long as we don't accept the underlying predispositions and presuppositions of the liberals. Old Testament intro was also a study under the general heading of biblical criticism. See, these four fields that you have before you on your outline, critical, historical, exegetical, theological, fit the old as well as the new. Now, you got real fast at the draw with that abbreviation OTI. Now you're going to get fast with an NTI that you've not had to practice thus far. But in the critical area, there are two subdivisions. There is lower criticism, and there is higher criticism. They also go by other names. Lower criticism is often called general criticism. And higher criticism is called special. These are just, th these are not inspired terms now. <laughs> These are just the terms that scholars have tagged onto various studies of the Bible. So I don't think that they're a latch key into heaven or anything like that. But if you're going to read anything, you need to be familiar with some of the terminology that you come across. So general criticism equals lower and special equals higher. Uh, that's analogous, I guess, to the subject of revelation. There's general revelation and there's special revelation. Or you could, some people call them lower and higher, but I think that general and special are the best known names. And general revelation concerns that method or mode of revelation that God uses to speak to men in general. Conscience, history, providence, concurrence, government, nature, the created order, and so forth. Special revelation is in scripturated revelation that which he has put forth in the 66 books in the canon of Scripture. Lower criticism is all, often also called textual criticism. Now, you should be familiar with that term. That deals with a study of the text and canon of, in this case, the New Testament. Higher criticism, however, is where New Testament introduction fits. See, we've had to break these four, we've had to break the whole field of New Testament studies down into four categories. First of those being critical. Then we have to break that down into lower criticism and higher criticism, the whole time searching for where New Testament introduction would naturally fit itself. It places itself here under higher criticism. This was a term, higher criticism, that was coined by the German writer Eichhorn, E-I-C-H-H-O-R-N, coined by Eichhorn in his preface to the second edition of his Old Testament introduction in 1787. Coined by Eichhorn in the preface to the second edition of his Old Testament introduction, published in 1787. Now, let me just say something about the, the mention of Eichhorn's name. You may remember his name from OT intro. Now, something you might not have known, however, is this fact. Back in those days, in the mid to late 17, let's say from 1750 to 1850, a hundred year period, from 1750 to 1850, um, people didn't, they weren't the specialists that they have become since then. Therefore, as a result, you would often find someone who wrote in Old Testament areas also writing in New Testament areas. Now, I'm telling you that because you're going to hear a lot of names that are going to be familiar, like Grossman and Hupfield and Ewald and Wellhausen and these names that you're familiar with from OT intro, and you might think, well, I thought they wrote on the old. Well, they did. They often wrote on the new as well. Uh, Eichhorn wrote on the new, as we will see in a moment. He was actually the first one to write a critical introduction to the New Testament. 
but he also was one of the first to write a critical introduction to the Old Testament. So you're going to see some of the names you've been familiar with before. And don't just relegate them to Old Testament studies. Sometimes you find them in New Testament areas as well. But then there will be a whole list of new names you might not be familiar with that, especially in the 19th century and the 20th, have concentrated in New Testament studies. Okay, so higher criticism or special criticism or New Testament introduction, they're all synonymous. They deal with things such as the authorship, the purpose, the date, the design, the destination, the recipients, and so forth of each of the New Testament books. In other words, the things that you're familiar with from OT intro. It's going to make it a lot easier that we've already done one study before. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your dropped jaw and raised eyebrows about seven years ago when we got into all of that? Well, what's going on? Who are these names? Well, it's very good to have some things behind us now because the area is kind of a familiar area that's at least been plowed over once. Not New Testament intro, but the general subject of higher critical discussions of the biblical text. So, let me say this to conclude number one here on, on our outline. The subject of biblical introduction <laughs> would look like this. It would have four parts. For the continuation of this... Subject of biblical introduction <laughs> would look like this. It would have four parts. It would have four parts. And you're going to be glad to see what these four parts are. Biblical introduction. Introduction means the things that you do first before you're allowed to go on. Biblical introduction then would look like this. It would have in the first place an introduction to the Old Testament. Well, we've already done that. Secondly, an introduction to the intertestamental period. Well, we're just about through with that. Thirdly, an introduction to the New Testament. These are the classes in biblical introduction, which we are beginning tonight. Fourthly, the subject in general of biblical literature, or that also could be put as number one. Either way would be fine. Which we are just about through with. So, praise God. In other words, we pretty much, well, as far as completion is concerned, <laughs> Seven years later, we've only done one out of four. That's OT intro. But by the end of this year, we'll have three out of four of those done. We're going to work very quickly over these next few months and finish those up. That takes care of biblical introduction then. Now look at what you've written down. I mean, if you'd go back, some of you do on occasion, just go and um, look over your OT intro notes. You've got a wealth of information there that introduces you to all of, all of those books, all 39 of those books in the Old Testament. Then you've got all of this information for what's going on between the Testaments and the political backgrounds and social backgrounds and religious backgrounds, which prepares you for the New Testament. We're through with this. You'll have step by step by step, introductory to be sure, but step by step by step study of everything in the New Testament. Then biblical literature, you understand canonicity, you understand manuscripts, how they were designated, why this one is important and that one isn't. You understand textual criticism. You understand ancient methods and modes of writing and writing materials. You're understanding a whole lot about all the translations which have been done. You see, once you get all of that out of, the, out of your way, not that it's something to get out of the way, but I mean, once you've done all of that, you have accomplished a whole lot. Still, we only call that an introduction to a study of the Bible. That's all it is, is an introduction. But you've got to be introduced to begin with. Then you know all that information. It helps so much whenever you're reading other material because you see these little superscripts and little funny writings and if you don't remember exactly what it is, you know what's going on there. You tell the fellow who's writing that book, you mumble under your breath, you can't bluff me out. I'm not just a lay person, a novice, unenlightened about these matters. I'm initiated into the higher studies of the Bible. <laughs> you can't bluff me out here. I, I'm not afraid of that. I might not remember it right now, but I've got it somewhere. I can look it up if I need to.
So that's a real benefit to have a handle on those things and you won't be swayed by other people. So all those classes serve to introduce us to the whole field of biblical studies. Now, <laughs> maybe for the benefit of some, even myself, I like to hear it. You can study all these things and go to hell. So that's where a lot of the critical scholars are. They're masters of these areas, but um, they're chained below. So there are other things to accomplish in the Christian life as well. Amen. All right, history of New Testament study, number two, all we're going to try to do tonight. History of New Testament study. Eusebius, the church historian, wrote a book entitled Ecclesiastical History in the year 325 A.D. which practically served as an introduction to the New Testament. Now, I know some of you have that book. He comments on a lot of things. I mean, it's church history from, you know, year zero up to 325. Eusebius and Ecclesiastical History, or you could just call it church history. One volume book. But he also comments on a lot of concerns in the New Testament, such as, uh, problems in parallel passages in the Gospels, for instance. Why does Matthew present the healing of this man this way and Mark presents it this way? It's the same man, same situation, same healing, but you've got different accounts of the healing. How can they be reconciled? On occasions, Eusebius actually delved into those matters. He was writing more than just church history. He was discussing things that concern the New Testament documents themselves. So although we really can't call this a textbook for New Testament intro, it's a textbook for early church history, to be sure, um, it practically served as an introduction to the New Testament in some areas for many, many years. Uh, then a man by the name of Hadrian wrote 125 years later in 450 A.D., a volume entitled An Introduction to the Holy Scriptures. An Introduction to the Holy Scriptures. But it was really anything but that. It was a misnamed book, I think. So we actually have to come up into the early 19th century, 1804, before we have our first formal, full-scale, critical introduction to the New Testament written. And that's a book by Eichhorn. E-I-C-H-H-O-R-N. The German scholar Eichhorn. Wrote the first critical introduction to the New Testament in 1804. Now, Eichhorn was a liberal scholar, so he was wrong in a lot of things. <clears throat> but he was the first one to try to do a systematic study in the higher special critical area, dealing with authorship, purpose, date, recipients, the place where the author was when it was written and so forth of the New Testament books. But it really wasn't until the middle of the 1800s that things really got going. So that's uh, in the field of New Testament introduction. So that's just a little over 100 years ago. It wasn't really until the middle of the 1800s that things really got going in the field of New Testament intro. And it was at this time the leaders, the initiators and the leaders of the movement in the field of New Testament criticism. We say New Testament criticism, and that includes lower and higher, but basically we would mean higher. If we mean lower, you call it textual. New Testament criticism is higher. Sad to say, the initiators and the defenders of this whole movement were, for the most part, from the higher critical liberal schools of New Testament interpretation. You don't have that many good, formal, full-scale conservative works done in the 19th century. And so this brings us to all of those forms of criticism you see on your outline, from Tübingen School down to finally conservative New Testament scholars. 
Now, a word about this listing here. You see, Tübingen source criticism, form or form Geschichte, and Lucan redaction, redaction Geschichte, Kerugma, eschatological historical criticism, liberal and conservative New Testament scholars. This is an area that for the most part concerns itself with New Testament studies. You see these words, source criticism, form criticism, redaction criticism, over and over and over and over. More often, these forms of higher critical liberal theories are used with regard to interpreting the New Testament than the Old. And they have been especially used when it comes to the so-called synoptic question of the agreement versus the disagreement of the first three Gospels, called the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We're going to see this subject probably in more detail. It will depend later, uh, page 2, under introducing the Gospels, notice letter C, the enigmatic synoptic question. And you see a history of the synoptic question, stating the question, uh, some proposed solutions, oral tradition, interdependence, two, four documents, and so forth, and then what we think are the biblical answers to the synoptic problem. That is where we're going to come across, back on page one, uh, these forms of higher critical liberal criticism, again, from Tübingen through source form, Lucan redaction, Kerugma, uh, eschatological historical criticism. So I think that they're so important and you probably know so little about them that it'd be good to look at them tonight in a very, very brief fashion just to introduce you to some of the terminology and some of the men behind it. And then we, ha we stand a good chance. I didn't put all this on the outline on page two since I already have it on page one, all these um, names of criticism. But we stand a good chance of having to discuss all of this over again over on page two whenever we get to the synoptic question. There we'll do it in a lot more detail. There we'll do it by actually giving you some examples so you can see how they work their way through some of these things. Okay, but I think that you are unfamiliar enough with these terms and these forms of liberalism that it wouldn't hurt for you to hear them twice over the next few months. Be introduced to them tonight and hear them later in a more extended fashion. All right, so let's start with letter A, or I just, I always will probably be back to numbering them one, two, three, but if I say that, you just look to your outline and find which one we're on. Number one, and that's the Tübingen School. T-U-B-I-N-G-E-N. It wasn't actually a very long-lasting school. It was a certain train of thought that was founded at Tübingen University in Tübingen, an ancient city in West Germany, just a few miles south of um, Stuttgart. Uh, the university had boasted such great names in the past as um, uh, Philip Melanchthon, who was uh, uh, Martin Luther's successor in writing his loci, in systematizing and putting in formal the writing of the Lutheran faith, the Lutheran German theological faith. Uh, so Melanchthon was a teacher. This was back at the end of the 15th and beginning of the 16th century, though. So this had been a very famous school. Now, at the end of the 18th century, the end of the 1700s, there was a Tübingen school that was a very, very conservative school headed up by people who were very, uh, well, they believed in the supernatural very much, in the inspiration of Scripture. But generally, whenever you see this phrase, Tübingen, or the Tübingen School, then they have reference to the school founded by F.C. Bauer, B-A-U-R or B-A-U-E-R, either way, F.C. Bauer. Uh, around the year 1831. While you're getting that down, something else about New Testament introduction here, since we haven't begun a new class in a long time, we're beginning one now, now's the time to really stay up. 
we're only going to be so long. We're not going to be years and years in this. You can already know that in advance. Now is the time to really stay up and master the material. You're starting at ground level here. So just remember that. I know how you come in on a study or you don't come in, but you just get lost in a study over the years. And, well, what's the worth? There's just so much here. I can't. Re well, we're starting at ground zero here. So there's really no excuse why you just can't stay up and remember a few of these things. It'll help you in the long run. F.C. Bauer, Ferdinand Christian Bauer, I think was his full name, but F.C. There are other Bauers. Bruno Bauer was another bad liberal. Bruno Bauer earlier, and there have been some other Bauers. But F.C., Ferdinand Christian, of all things, Bauer, is the name that heads up this new liberal school of New Testament studies at Tübingen University. By the way, Tübingen is still there. I know some evangelical scholars who took some of their degrees from Tübingen so they could say they studied under really weird German professors. F.C. Bauer lived from 1792 to 1860. You see, tonight will be one of those a little more technical. When we get into actually studying Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then we'll be really turning to a lot of passages. 1792 to 1860, he was appointed uh, professor of church history which is interesting, at Tübingen in 1826, and he held that chair until he died in 1860. But he wrote a paper, presented to the faculty in the year 1831. That really is the beginning of the so-called Tübingen School. Sometimes you read the date 1826. That's because that's when F.C. Bauer begins his professorship at the University of Tübingen. Now, do any of you know anything about the Tübingen School? What was their view? Have you seen the word before? Yeah. Yeah. All right, some of you have seen the word. See, you're on the way then. You don't know what that means, though, do you? You couldn't explain that. All right, so I thought that a lot of these um, forms of criticism here, you may have heard of them, but you don't know really what they are. So let me explain to you just briefly what the Tübingen School was all about. What Bauer did, he borrowed um, Hegel's uh, philosophy of the dialectic. This goes way back into ethics, and we discussed that. Now, I just read a recent evangelical scholar who denied the influence of um, Hegelian dialectalism in F.C. Bauer's Tübingen theology, but I think that he's wrong. I think that it is there, and most scholars feel that it is. But he based his New Testament understanding on an underlining Hegelian dialectic. Maybe I need to go back and just refresh your memory on what the German philosopher Hegel had to say about the dialectic. Hegel felt, Hegel was a pantheist in his theology, but Hegel felt that the whole history of the world could be explained on the basis of a dialectic that there's always a thesis that presents itself and begins to grow, that, that is reacted against by an antithesis, the opposite or something or someone who's holding something or that's not the same as the thesis, which then produces a synthesis in the long run. Now, that's Hegel's view of the, his philosophy of history, how history has evolved and how and why we are today where we are on the basis of his dialectic. What Bauer did, he took this same principle of the dialectic, that everything is to be seen as a synthesis of an earlier thesis antithesis rivalry, and he applied that to early church history and the New Testament books. You say, all right, I understand that. How did he apply that? All right, here's how he did that. Very, it's an ingenious theory. It's just too bad it's not biblical. It's an ingenious theory. It's a neat way of explaining certain things in the Bible, but it has not a shred of evidence. And, well, that school was bankrupt within a couple of years, and Bauer was ostracized by the faculty there at Tübingen, although they weren't the most conservatives around, and the school pretty much died. But it has had a profound impact on New Testament studies ever since then, not with Hegelian dialectic being applied to the New Testament, but with this rationalism, this higher critical liberalism 
denial of divine authorship, denial of the miraculous that came as a result, a byproduct of applying a Hegelian dialectic to New Testament early church history. So what he did is that he propounded that there were two rival parties. You've got to have two things, thesis and antithesis. There were two rival parties in the New Testament which could be called the Jewish and the Hellenistic or which could be called the Petrine after Peter and the Pauline after Paul. The one stood for law and the other stood for grace. You see, scholars have recognized over the years that there appears to be some type of tension, especially whenever you take James, his second chapter with Paul, Book of Romans, and his fourth chapter. There appears to be some underlying inconsistency or rivalry. Of course, it's only apparent. It's not real. But scholars have sensed that that exists in the New Testament. So how are we going to go about explaining that? It may be better to call one of them the James party because James Bauerfeld was really the James the Just, James the Lord's half-brother, James the leader of the Church of Jerusalem and the leader of the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, was really the staunch one, the Jewish one uh, in the midst of the early apostles. And here comes Paul presenting another gospel, a Gentile gospel, a Hellenistic gospel, the gospel of grace which is opposed to law. Now, for instance, if you just quickly in your Bible over in the book of Acts, uh, turn over to Acts um, 21. Acts 21 and verse 18. See if you don't remember this situation here. In other words, in this situation, talking about James and Paul at Jerusalem, it appears that James has a different slant to his Christian theology than Paul does. He's more Jewish, more for the law, more for Jews, more for Moses' teaching. Paul seems to be freer. He seems to be experiencing more liberty. The day following, Paul went in with us unto James. That's James, often called James the Just. James and all the elders were present. And... They say in verse 20, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs to come together, for they will hear that you're come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them, Take them and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law and so forth. That's been a difficult passage for interpreters ever since it was written evidently. I've heard charismatics with their views and non-charismatic evangelicals with their views and it seems like, I mean, if James is an early Christian, why is he and Paul, why are he and Paul so different from one another? Well, according to Bauer, there's an underlying rivalry between the two. One is basically Jewish, James. The other is basically Gentile, at least in his theology, and that's the Apostle Paul. This rivalry is a very bitter rivalry. It's actually seen, as a matter of fact, over in Galatians 2, they would argue, where Paul rebuked Peter to his face. Peter was too Jewish. Paul was more Gentile, Hellenistic, freer, the libertine in the group. And he actually rebuked Peter to his face. And so his explanation of early church history is a synthesis of the rivalry. And you'll see how this affects your interpretation of the New Testament in just a moment. If you'll just hold on, you've got to follow all this that the explanation, the best way to explain early church history is to see it as an Hegelian synthesis of the Petrin James thesis and the Pauline antithesis. One standing for law, the other for grace. And that 
the best way to explain early church history is the Hegelian synthesis. So here's what that calls him to do. He then went back to the New Testament. You see, you have to accept these presuppositions to begin with. He went back to the New Testament, and depending on whether or not any given book under consideration manifests a tendency towards that rivalry, depending on whether or not it manifests that dependency, he would date it late versus early. In other words, if it did not manifest a tendency, sometimes Bauer's form of theology is not just called the Tubingen School, but called tendency criticism. If it didn't manifest a tendency toward that spirit of rivalry, then it obviously had to be a result of late Christian history, the Hegelian synthesis. That then caused him Oh, let me say it another way. He said that the, all the New Testament books could be divided up into three classifications. Your thesis, your antithesis, your synthesis. Let me just quickly put some books in those different categories so maybe you can follow it by example better. For instance, the thesis would be on the Jewish Petrin James side, the Peter James Jewish law side. All those words go together on the same side of your ledger. On the Jewish side would be, oh, Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew is a very Jewish gospel. There's no question about that. Versus Mark, Luke, not as much John, but even versus John. And the book of Revelation. Those would fit on the thesis side. On the antithesis side, see, it's got to manifest some type of rivalry. In other words, are you following what I'm saying thus far, or are, are you not following it? In other words, Matthew's gospel, you have to kind of accept this, and part of it's true, but it doesn't prove what they think that it proves. Matthew's gospel is very Jewish in its orientation. It's very Jewish. So that must have come early by some Jewish writer, Matthew or whoever it was, doesn't matter, but by a, a hyper-Jewish writer who was reacting against this grace gentile hellenistic pauline side of early christianity and the book of revelation would be the same therefore those could possibly be dated rather early then on the other side the antithesis would be obviously the writings of paul but with this exception only those writings of paul which manifest his tendency view here a tendency toward rivalry in other words, it can't be one of Paul's nice little smooth letters. It's just kind of general talking about everything, such as what? Oh, well, Ephesians. Ephesians, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're all one in Christ. The middle wall of partition has been broken down. N nice general book. It doesn't seem that Paul's arguing against anything. He's not mad at anybody. So that obviously couldn't be the work of the man Paul. You see, only those books of Paul because he was the leader of the movement, an emancipation movement that manifests a tendency toward rivalry would be accepted. So as a result, all of the Pauline books were thrown out as being non-authentic. That is, they were not written by Paul with the exception of, see if you can name which ones. Now, there are, you see, I'm going to show you if I've got time tonight that, that Bauer has serious problems with this type of theory here. He's got some underlying presuppositions that don't hold any water, not a shred of support or evidence. And the biblical books themselves will contradict that. But then you can resort to another form of criticism called redaction criticism to take care of that. What books are Pauline? I mean, they were written by Paul. Romans? There's only four. Galatians, definitely by Paul. You might not know the other two. Definitely not Ephesians. See, Ephesians is too easy and smooth. It's too general. The church universal. We're in heavenly places. There's no argument there. First Corinthians, I heard someone say. And second Corinthians. Those are the only four books that the Tubingen School accepted as being authentically Pauline. And some scholars down to this day hold at least a modified form of that theory. 
those books could be dated prior to A.D. 70. Revelation could be dated prior to A.D. 70. Matthew could perhaps be dated prior to A.D. 70. In other words, you've got to get it back into the time period in which Peter, James, and Paul lived, and they had two. I mean, what you're supposed to picture, this is what Bauer thinks, two warring factions in the church that were very definitely fighting against one another, the other having, they thought, a, force, a false form of theology. Everything else, then, besides these books, Revelation, Matthew, and these four authentic Pauline, everything else in the New Testament would be dated way into the 2nd century A.D. And the greatest book of them all, the greatest synthesis of them all, would be the book of Acts. At that time, Acts really took a boost in popularity and has been studied um, vehemently ever since then. Because Acts is the book that presents the synthesis, as well as the other New Testament books. So the New Testament documents are worthless, except for historical studies. Because you either have A, a book trying to propagate Judaism, B, a book trying to propagate Hellenism, or C, Later Christians were looking back and trying to smooth over, over the differences of the earlier two parties. That makes the New Testament unreliable then. See, Acts is not a A.D. 50, A.D. 60 book written by Luke. It's written by some Christian in around 150 A.D., looking back, trying to smooth over the differences seen in the rival factions of the early church. Now, do you, do you understand what the Tübingen School is about? This is also called tendency criticism here. Well, you see, the reason they like the book of Acts is take, for instance, a council at Jerusalem. The council of Jerusalem, what do we have? We've got Paul coming with some others. He believes that the gospel is free of charge and it's to Gentiles and we've got others that of the Pharisaic party that believe that men must be circumcised Gentiles first and then they can believe in Christ and so in Acts 15 you've got Peter presenting his view Barnabas and Paul their view James stands up presents his view and at the end what happens everybody agrees and they live happily ever after this message will be continued on the following